A warm welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining this session. It's wonderful to be here with all of you, and I hope you're finding the convening meaningful so far. My name is Robert Bank, and I am a proud SRE Network Advisory Board member, and I serve as the President and CEO of American Jewish World Service, a global Jewish human rights organization that funds over 500 organizations each year in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, many of which are working on issues that are very aligned with what we'll be discussing today. That is working to create enabling environments where women, men, and adolescent girls and boys can develop skills around conversations to prevent and respond to gender-based violence and abuse. Before I bring in our exceptional panelists, I'm gonna give a brief framing of our session. We are gonna focus on two interrelated, critically important issues communication and policies, both of course critical to building healthy workplaces. First, how we have a survivor-centered conversation, how we have survivor-centered conversations about misconduct and abuse in the workplace. And second, how to create meaningful and human-centered policies. Our panelists will talk about their experiences in the field and will share examples of survivor-centered, values-driven conversations and policies to prevent and respond to abuse in the workplace and in our larger community. I'm delighted that we'll have an opportunity to hear from Dr. Shira Berkowitz, Dr. Karen Megaginity, and Sarah Pearson to join me in this space. Welcome, Shira, Karen, and Sarah. It's wonderful to see you all. I'm not going to read each of your impressive bios. I know that the convening participants have them, but what I will say is that it's truly been an honor to learn from each of you as we've prepared for this session. And I'm looking forward to having each of you share your wisdom with our audience today. So let's dive in. I want to ask you for a first round could you each share what brought you to this work? And for each of you, how does this inform your approach to talking about sexual abuse in the workplace? Sarah, let's start with you. Great, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here with this wonderful group of people to have a wonderful conversation, which is exactly the thing that I am passionate about. And so, you know, so, so I think you know, what brought me to this work um, was, you know, I think if we went all the way back would be a conversation that I had when I was 11 years old with my mother. And in that conversation, I shared with my mother that a family member was abusing me. Um, and, and in that moment, there were a couple of things that I learned. So, you know, my mother believed me in that moment, right? And so I think, which was the most powerful thing that she could have done. Uh, I think that I also learned that it was the lack of conversations that had led us to that moment and um, sort of a history and generational history of not, of not having um, conversations about um, boundaries and bodies and healthy relationships and all of those things. Um, and, and, and so, it, you know, in some ways that, that single conversation changed the trajectory of my life and in other ways that conversation changed absolutely nothing of my lived experience. And so, um, but when I think about kind of what the journey forward looked like for me, you know, I think about conversations as, as the things that helped me heal from that experience. I think about conversations as the things that helped the people around me become better friends, um, loved ones, supporters, allies. Um, you know, I, I think about conver the role of conversations um, when it comes to um, workplaces. And so, you know, so it sort of had led me on a journey to just be really curious about conversations and the role and the power that they can play. Um, and so, so, and, and in particular, it was, con it was those first conversations, right? Because when you think about a first conversation, it is, um, it, it, it's something where you are, are, are coming with into this void of silence. And it's like, how do I start? And what do I say? And what does that conversation look like? And so, um, so I, I talked to hundreds, I mean, I, I love talking to people about all of the things that are uncomfortable. I started a nonprofit about it. I wrote a book about it. Um, and so, you know, when, when I think about conversations in the context of, the, of what we are talking about today, 
is that is that it's conversations that help us develop the skills that we need to follow the rules of the road. And yeah. so it's and it's those two things together that really help us to create workplaces that are that are safe, that are healthy, that are respectful. So I think you know that's that's a little mm -hmm. bit about what brought me to this work. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Karen, over to you. What brought you to this work? Well, I think I have to first confess that it isn't actually my work that I trained for. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I feel that it's very much become a calling of sorts. Mm. And I'll explain what I mean by that, because there were effectively two factors that uh, contributed to my getting deeper involved. And the first factor was the immense outpouring of support uh, and gratitude that I was the recipient of after I wrote a piece um, about my own experience with sexual misconduct and abuse of power and called on the Jewish community to confront this particular problem. And I had anticipated um, you know, support uh, from family, from friends, from close colleagues, but the support that I received came from so many far-flung um, places and people, including many individuals that I had never met personally. Uh, and that was mixed with an abundance of, of gratitude. Uh, and one of those people was yourself, Robert. Uh, and, and the note that you sent me then uh, meant a tremendous amount to me as I uh, have long um, really been grateful as, and, and respected the work of the American Jewish World Service. So that your note uh, meant a lot then and it does now. So there was the surprise of this, the, the amount of support and the gratitude that made me wonder why, why are people so grateful, right? Like mm -hmm. I had written about um, bad things that had occurred in my life and yet uh, I was calling on our community to, to act and it was about something much bigger um, than my own experience. It really was about um, something that we needed to address as a community and that had affected so many people, um, which I, I think is part of why there was so much gratitude um, for you know, doing something that I felt compelled to do, uh, that I really felt like I had to do in, in order to hopefully protect other folks. So the first factor was the support and the gratitude. Um, the second was this desire to really pay it forward. And for that, I have to thank uh, a woman named Debbie Finling because it was a really pivotal conversation uh, that I had with her at a moment in time when I was struggling to figure out what, if anything, to do. and trying to find other people who had perhaps experienced um, sexual misconduct and abuse of power uh, at the hands of the same person. And there were people on the East Coast talking to people on the West Coast, trying to figure out you know, who might know who. And then at one point, someone shared with me that, that they had found someone. Um, and it turned out that people on each coast that had found the same person and that person was me. <laughs> so there wasn't another person to to sort of hold hands with, if you will. I, I was imagining this Thelma and Louise moment where we would take the leap together and somehow that would that would decrease my my fear factor. And mm -hmm. the conversation with Debbie was one in which she um, I said, what if I'm alone? What if I'm the only one? And she said, First, that that was unlikely, and she was correct about that. Second, that uh, even if I was, and even if only one thing had happened, that it was still wrong. Um, much like robbing a bank, you know, <laughs> the bank that gets robbed is is enough, uh, still uh, wrong. And also, then when I um, thanked her, she said she kind of brushed off my gratitude and said, "Pay it forward." And so that idea of paying it forward um, has really uh, propelled me into and, and kept me going um, through, through this work long after I thought I would be involved. I, I honestly thought after 
the initial media buzz and uh, the journalistic expose, the Title IX case, uh, that everything would would pass and I would go back to my relatively private and quiet life. Mm. Um, that that didn't occur, uh, and you know I. I reached a kind of fork in the road, and I I chose to continue. Um, so I um, I'm continuing to pay it forward, and and that's what brought me to mm. the work. Mm. I want to thank you so much, Karen. Really, I want to thank you on behalf of the entire Jewish community, if I can do such a um, audacious thing, um, and recognize that this is probably I think you had mentioned, um, and I recall. Um, probably sort of the fourth anniversary of that op-ed coming up or something in June. Mm -hmm. And um, just um, how you have, through your courage and through your speaking, um, paid it forward um, for so many. Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Shira. Shira, you um, are doing incredible work for this community. Um, I know the session just prior to this was about KLM and I'd love to hear about how you came to this work and how does that background inform how you approach it? I kept seeing cases in which people were mishandling um, the case and you know it was, it's like you can kind of wrap your head around the idea of a bad actor or somebody doing something harmful. It's it's really hard to wrap your head around the idea that an entire institution, an entire community could watch that harm uh, and then get it so wrong. And the more I read about institutional abuse or mishandling, cover-ups of cases, uh, the more I read about organizational leaders who were being portrayed as really terrible, really awful. But this was not consistent with what I knew to be true which is that many of the people who were being named as complicit, these were otherwise strong leaders who had done much good. And so I became really interested in what gets in the way of proper case handling and how can good people go so wrong. Some of what I learned is that often it's numerous people involved in the case handling and they may have been doing a whole bunch of things that were right and then they made one or two mistakes. And so for each of them, they're like, well, I only made this one mistake. But taken collectively, all of these one or two mistakes amounted to significant additional damage and pain to the individual who had already been harmed. And other times, it was well-intentioned people who thought that they were doing a good thing, but because they weren't properly trained or because they didn't have the proper systems in place, they inadvertently caused harm. And so, for instance, an organizational leader um, might want to really make sure to include the voice of the person who was harmed in the process. And so, as a result, they may ask a question like, what do you want to see happen here? Um, and so, right, they're trying to center the voice of the person harmed, but without recognizing that the burden of the organizational response can't be on the individual harm. Um, or another example might be uh, removing an employee who reported harassment from having to meet with their harasser. And while this might be really well-intentioned to protect the individual from additional harm, it's more likely retaliation in which you're removing an opportunity for advancement rather than addressing the harassing behavior head on. And so the more I understood all of this, and of course, not every mishandling is well-intentioned, so let's definitely say that. Um, but the more I understood that great harm, a feeling of um, immense betrayal by the community, this kind of secondary trauma, which is often equal to or worse than the initial trauma, that this was being caused by everyday people, the more I wanted to help standardize, uh, systematize our prevention and response efforts. Um, and that instead of judging or making this personal, we really need to just make this procedural. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Shira. So each of you have spoken about really what I would call advances in the field. 
And uh, when we were talking in advance of this session, there was some discomfort with the word innovation as a descriptor of progress in this area of work. So, um, you know, how do you each think of the advances you might be making, we might be making? Do you think of these advances as innovations? Sarah, let's go, let's go to you, Sarah. So, I, I don't know if I would if I would call them um, innovations, right? I mean, I think that I mean I, I, what I do call them is conversations. Um, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps the the collective insight, which I you know, which I kind of want to pull in from from what Shira and Karen and Karen shared earlier is is it's about what types of conversations are we having and when are we having them, right? So if we wait for incidents to take place. And then we are judging ourselves by the conversations that happen afterwards. It's like it should be no surprise that those conversations don't go very well, right? And you know, and I think I think in some cases they they do, right? Like so that sometimes there is an overwhelming kind of part of support, but but also why did we have to get here in order for there to be positive conversations and support for somebody who is experiencing harm in their community? And also, you know, I think there are some very real risks for for coming forward and um, and for reporting incidents of, you know, whether it is within your family, whether it is within your religious community, whether it is within your place of work, right, is that there are some really, some, some significant risks. And so I think the way, the way, the way that we back into those conversations, to me, is just a little bit of the difference, right, is that when we make the conversation solely about a perpetrator and a victim, rather than about the whole community, and the harm that comes to a community when anybody in that community is harmed. And so how do we, again, create, how do we create a space where accountability can exist, um, conversations about accountability can exist, where we can have trust in systems where, those, where that trust has been broken. Um, and, and I think when it comes down to it for me, when I think about it, it's just, is that the way that, you know, conversation is culture. And so if we can change the kinds of conversations we have and when we have them, that's how we're going to change the culture. And so whether we're doing that, you know, I think sort of as Karen talked about through the through the power of platforms, the power of media, um, there's also the power of policies and, and sort of the way that they're developed. But all of those, it's, you know, in order to do those things, we have to talk. And so how do we talk? What do we talk about? <laughs> Um, how do we do it? You know, and so for me, is like that's that is ultimately how we change culture. Thank you, thank you, uh, Shira. Wh what do you think of this um, issue of innovations and advances, and what you've been doing, and sort of where you see the arc, the journey? Yeah, I, I really appreciate what Sarah just said. Um, it's about uh, creating the living piece of the policy, right? It's not just mm -hmm. innovations in policy, which is sometimes maybe how we talk about it, um, but it's innovations in communication. I love this, the conversation, um, transparency, accountability, the group buy-in. Um, and so I guess I'd say like maybe, one is I'm totally uncomfortable with the word innovation. So I'll full disclosure that, that I was one of the, uh, the reactors to that. Um, you know, it's hard to think of what you're doing as innovative. I think in part because part of the answer to the problem of abuse or mishandling of abuse is, is having humility. And when institutions get it right, it's because they understand they don't have all the answers. Right. They reach out right. for help. Uh, it's because when they develop policies, they, they don't come in and say, this is the policy, but rather, um, they do a lot of research on best practices. Um, they get buy-in from the people who are impacted by the policy. They're not creating a policy that will affect others without including their voices. Um, and they're getting it reviewed by external people. And so this is, this is what we try to do at Sacred Spaces uh, when we create our own policy. We're notoriously slow on this, uh, for better or worse. Um, and part of that process is, you know, we might start by brainstorming together and then throwing pieces on uh, 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 words on a piece of paper. And then we, you know, it's a Google doc and everyone's commenting and giving opinions. And then we draft from there and then we come back together and we say, what do we think? And we tear it apart again. And then we iterate and then we iterate. And then when we think we're done with the policy, um, we'll come back together and we'll say, okay, everybody read a different guideline. Um, say what you think it means to you. And then like when, 
you hear each other say it, you're like, huh, and I had a different understanding of what that meant. And so it's actually what Sarah's talking about, this conversation um, that we have together where we start to understand where we need to clarify. Um, we start to have shared language and shared expectations. Um, and then we build in, or we try to build in, you know, like I'm thinking about our, our staff meeting interaction guidelines that went through this extensive process. Then we build in an opportunity into the guidelines that they have to be reviewed together twice a year, rediscussed because staff transition, our thinking evolves. Um, so that's in like the policy development side. And then I think like when you try to implement your policies, um, it's also about conversation there. And so if if we're gonna say um, multiple pathways to reporting, so don't just report to the head of the organization, but report to the board. If your staff know who the board person is, that board member needs to come in and have conversations with your staff. And so I don't know if it's innovations, but it's, it's like bringing the, the words on the paper to life. Um, and you mentioned Kayleem. That's, that's what we tried to do with Kayleem as well, which is, of course, um, we started with experts uh, and research in developing, but then also brought in a panel of nine outside reviewers who had very divergent um, experiences um, to help us see what we couldn't see on our own. Thank you. That's um, That sounds pretty innovative to me. Um, but um, how about you, Karen? How, how do you feel about this? I agree that it's innovative. And uh, Shira, listening to you, I, I want to say that what may seem slow internally appears lightning speed, uh, at least to me. And I, I want to thank you for in, in inviting me and involving me. I think, I think the process that Sacred Spaces uses uh, and certainly the involvement that I had the privilege of uh, participating in with the Kaloom toolkit uh, is, is one that brings together the victim survivor or persister as, as I prefer um, to identify to, to really be involved in the innovative process and contribute to it, which is um, both intellectually very stimulating and, and quite restorative. I think it's part of the healing process. I, I'd also um, add that my own kind of uh, discomfort with innovations or um, yeah, or innovating has to do with a, a level of frustration that that I'll admit to which is that as as far as we've come or as much progress as we've made and there are amazing um, organizations such as Shira's and Sarah's and and many others that are doing incredible work um, and I, I won't list them all for fear of leaving one out uh, but at the same time, we have yet to normalize saying me too. We have yet to make it um, like standard operating procedure. We have yet to uh, create multiple avenues for the individuals who are trying to figure out a way forward. Um, I, I think that that's where my frustration um, comes from because, because I hear from these people and you know they're they're trying to navigate what I was trying to navigate four years ago, and uh, and that tells me that we have a lot more innovating to do um, so that the baton can get passed. And I think you know part of my own struggle with it has to do with um, the way that someone who comes forward is perceived as being exceptional in some way. Um, and, you know, I'll just share that people have said, oh, you are a hero. And I don't think of myself as a hero. I never wanted to be a hero. I never intended to be a hero. I don't um, identify that way at all. And I also think that what that does is it separates the people who, who do speak out and come forward from everyone else by making it exceptional and, and rare, you know, it rarefies. It, rather than normalizing it, and uh, it, it it works against us in ways um, that we need to think about because in reality it's this um, communal struggle with the idea of um, of bringing to light or attention bad behavior uh, that we we don't necessarily want to bring to light, but we need to and 
there's a, you know, there's a, an ongoing discomfort with that. So when I stop hearing from people, I'll perhaps feel like we're, we're further along um, this, this tr particular trajectory. And then, and then maybe innovations will, will mean something else. And I, I look forward to celebrating that moment. Sarah, what do you think about this um, normalizing piece and, and this um, piece that Karen was talking about? Oh, I'm obsessed with normalizing conversations, uncomfortable ones. And so, so you know, one of the things um, is that, you know, I, I think Karen, you're right, it's sort of that, that, uh, that sort of odd discomfort of how we kind of make survivors who have stepped forward, particularly in this Me Too moment as that sort of like, we, you know, the the kind of heroification, for lack of a, a better phrase, right? It's like there's something that I think it's really great to be able to, to celebrate and to show support. And then there is also just something that's kind of like uncomfortable about that, too. And so, you know, I, so I, I really appreciate sort of, I, you know, I appreciate the way that um, that that um, that you named that because there's also these kind of very real reasons why many people don't step forward. And also just how do you start that conversation like even, you know, even early. But so, so the way that I thought about it was, so what if like instead of making these like individuals famous, like we could just make like having uncomfortable, like the topic of sexual violence prevention famous, mm -hmm. right? So the way that I thought about it was if there's these YouTube video channels that are people playing video games and they have millions of viewers like why could we not do something like that 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 would simply just be about all of the different ways that you can enter conversations to support survivors or what do you say if you read some i mean what do you say what do you say if you read somebody's op-ed and about about an experience that they had you know and so i would imagine that there's for as many people who came to you, I would imagine that there were probably some people that you knew very well who just said absolutely nothing in the wake of that too. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and maybe it was because they didn't know what to say or they didn't know how to start the conversation or they didn't want to say the wrong thing. And so there's just all of these th things that get in the way. And so that's the thing that I have fun. So I started a nonprofit, it's a YouTube channel. It's called the, it's, you know, all we do is produce videos. It's called The Uncomfortable Conversation. And they're all really designed to help people imagine in a little bit of a lighter way of just like, how can you get involved in this conversation, right? It's like, you know, is, is that you don't need to wait for an expert or a trainer or like somebody who knows what they're doing to come into the room. Because if we don't all get better at this, nothing's gonna change. And so, you know, so if each positive conversation is sort of a light on our pathway to a community that we would much rather live in than the one that you know, sort of allows these types of things to take place, um, that's, you know, like, that's the world that, that I imagine. So, so again, so I think that's, that's some of the work and the fun that we have, um, doing the work around the uncomfortable conversation. But yes, I mean, I think it's really important to normalize. Yeah, Karen, thank you, Sarah. Um, Karen, I want to just go back to a word you used, which was persister. Can you tell us, um, a little bit about the word and, and why you, um, prefer that word? rather than survivor or victim, et cetera? Oh, sure, thank you for asking. So I think, I think first of all, it's very important for everyone to identify however they feel comfortable, right? And I recognize that I was victimized. Uh, however, I don't consider myself a victim. And the word survivor to me, um, means uh, someone who you know fought and prevailed against cancer or um, outlived the Holocaust or something along those lines and I, I don't put um, my experiences in that realm and so I was looking for another word that I, that I could use and I thought about um, a particular senator Elizabeth Warren who had been told to stop speaking effectively and yet she persisted. And therefore, I, I feel like as a someone who just kept going, um, you know, kept kept researching, kept writing, kept speaking, kept having the difficult conversations and continues to that, that I'm, I'm persisting and therefore I am a persister uh, among many. Thank you. Thank you. Shira, so what gets in the way of creating humane policies, values-driven policies, 
like you're trying to work at um, internally at sacred spaces? Well, um, I think part of what gets in the way is that things are social, they're psychological, they're emotional for us. Um, and so when things happen, we often make it about trust or the relationship. Don't you trust me? Um, aren't we closer than this? How could you doubt? Um, but we need to make it about the behavior. We need to make it about our procedures and our policies. It's not about treating one person differently than we would treat another, but it's about what um, exemplary behavior looks like all around and that we need to expect this of everyone. So um, one thing that gets in the way, at least on the response side of following our response policies is about um, that relationship piece. I, I think also to stand up um, for victims, survivors, thrivers, persisters, um, it requires us to speak badly about another person mm -hmm. uh, and to stand up for the person who caused harm is to do nothing. And we spend our lives not wanting to be people who are, you know, gossiping or speaking badly and, and to understand that actually that's not what this is. Um, just it, it requires us to go against things that we've worked on. Um, and it requires a reconceptualization around values such as Lashon Hara or prohibitions against slander and understanding that that's not what this is. And I want to bracket here and say like, and there's not only one way to stand up for somebody and social media is one way but there's a lot of things people can do behind the scenes as well um and i guess i wanted to also say like i think it's about competing values right is that every time we make a policy decision when we're forming a policy we're always balancing values um and this is on my mind particularly this morning the whole morning because last night i was preparing to go to um, a funder dinner and my four-year-old says to me, as I'm like all dressed and ready to go, says, Ima, which is Hebrew for mama, um, what's more important? Is it more important <laughs> to go to this dinner to say thank you for giving us money to do important work? Or is it more important to do the important work of putting your kids to bed? <laughs> Now, I'll let you guess what I did. <laughs> of course, I did both, and I hope I wasn't too late. Um, but, uh, you know, I've really been thinking about the profound wisdom in that, right? It's like from the mouths of babes. But uh, we make choices all the time, and even our good choices when we're trying to do something right. It's bumping up against another value and so i'd say like when it's not always clear to us we have to start with the first step which is recognizing that we have a tension of values we see this between security protocols which say lock everything down and safeguarding protocols which say open everything up and give us some transparency and light in here and so when we recognize this tension then we start to put together which is the value i need to prioritize in this moment um, and if i have to pick one value that should guide us each and every time it's you know actually something robert that you said it's uh to value the human in front of us the cell that each person was created in the image of god and that this person right now in front of us is telling us something that we need to listen to deeply thank you thank you karen what do you think about this uh i think I'm grateful to Shira for reminding me of uh, a time when my daughter, also named Shira, was younger and uh, asked me a, a different but similar question as I was heading out to give a talk. And she asked me, Ima, are they paying you? Because <laughs> <Which, laughs> so she knew that there were plenty of times when I, they hadn't. When I, you know, when I, so there's again, um, as you were just saying, Shira, about competing values, right? Like doing the work that we're so passionate about and how, and at the same time, where is the equity piece of it, right? Um, and I, I think for me, what gets in the way or what I think about what gets in the way of, of the progress that we're trying to make has a very historical component that ties mm -hmm. in with um, the self-governance that we as a people needed in order to survive, right? To protect ourselves 
and to protect yeah. ourselves from whom from them so it was us yeah. against them and um yeah. you know that that's that's generational trauma um yeah. it, it, it it's a reality and unfortunately it kind of seeps into the way we go about the the work that we're doing now that in, inhibits us in some ways um because we don't necessarily um, want to call out or draw attention to anything negative um, because we are still very much a, a minority um, people. Um, and there's also um, this kind of tendency to create, I'm thinking now about policies in particular, like to create a policy. Um, and I was privileged to, to serve as an ombud for the association Jewish studies um, for the sexual misconduct committee that began as a task force and then it became a committee. Oh, and now it's actually an office. And uh, we work very hard, you know, countless hours on creating a policy and procedures. Um, however, once we had those, it was like they became, um, they weren't living anymore. And so I think a lot about how do we keep revisiting them so they don't, um, I think, someone said during our prep session, you know, go on the shelf and stay there. It's like, we, they need to be, it's claim. They need to be living trees, um, documents, constitutions, um, so that we revisit them. And I think also if we, um, if we hold short of being transparent when we implement them, for example, if we make sanctions of one kind or another after something bad has happened, um, but we don't share that. We don't, you know, let other people know. Then there's still that aura of um, of secrecy, and um, it's like still a hushed conversation, as opposed to a public consequence of of what happens, and one that everyone can, you know, take take stock of. And it's it's about more than putting people on notice or or you know requiring them to uh, agree to a policy prior to attending a conference and it's more about the mm. buy-in from everyone um that the, that this is the kind of larger community that we want to to live in and and to create and sustain and and to just add one more thing i i, I and it kind of ties in with the previous part of our conversation having to do with um, recognition or, or acknowledgement. I think that, you know, people wonder about the peep, the whistleblower, the, the, the person who mm -hmm. has come forward and, and I'm honored to be here with all of you. And at the same time, I think that um, there's a, like a lack of real public recognition of some of the early you know, Gamani, hashtag Gamani pioneers who really got it going and and of people who come forward and and that they're okay, you know, and, and that we're okay and that it's a positive thing, that it that it's a good I mean the Jewish community is, I believe, we're very good at singing praises, right? But when there's something that's uncomfortable, there's no there's no communal award for that. In other words, it's more, it, it's kept on the down low, e even if it's in the mm. media in some way, it's still not um, like publicly recognized as something that was good for someone to do. And mm. so that then, um, fuels the concerns about, well, is it okay? Is it really okay if I speak out or will I be treated differently? You know, will people look at me differently? Um, and, and so that's that's another thing that gets in the way. It's it's all wrapped together with with lack of transparency, lack of recognition, and 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 lack of reassuring people that they're not alone. Um, but the only way that people really know that there's life after is if we um, celebrate mm. the the achievements along the way. Thank you. So. Sort of as we come to close, I just want to thank you all for this um, incredibly rich conversation and for bringing so much of yourselves into this work. And um, there have been so many teachings um, in what you've said already. 
And I would like to ask you as we come to close, each of you, what are you really hopeful about in this work? Um, how do you see the work that you're doing um, really building this better world? Um, I can see it, but I'd love to, I'd love to hear it from each of you. Um, so let's start with Sarah. What? Well, this conversation today gives me quite a bit of hope. And so I think that, that every time we are able to sort of do a rep in a healthy conversation, and live to tell the tale and feel good about the connections that we've made or and and bring that conversation out and so i think it's you know as, as i think about you know is, is what is the next conversation that we can all commit to have and um and who are we going to have it with and and how can we bring more people who you know who are the people that need to be in these conversations who aren't yet and and how can we get them started thank you sarah over to you shira so picking up on that idea of continuing, um, I'm really celebrating all the ways in which we're starting to see um, efforts uh, to address SRE in the small ways that they present itself. So it's not like I, I celebrate the big ways, this, this convening, for instance, but also all the small ways in which in your daily operations or programming. And so one example of that would be, you know, when I was invited to register for SRE, I got a code of conduct. And I read that code of conduct, which was beautifully written and so intentional and had been revised from last year's code of conduct. And I just loved seeing the iteration, the thoughtfulness and the way in which like a simple act of registering now also has this lens. And I'm starting to see other organizations follow in SRE's lead. So ways that that happens. And I guess I'm, I'm really grateful to SRE for supporting KLEAM, our open access policy toolkit. And with, almost immediately upon release of KLEAM, we had over 500 people um, jumping in. And so just like that people are in this and want to talk about it and, and do the work, that's really exciting. That is exciting. Karen. I am, I am both uh, excited and hopeful that through having these conversations about about challenging topics and it just occurs to me now how how this question uh, and th uh, the conversation that we're currently having dovetails with the work I do around intermarriage education and interfaith inclusion you know in a community where intermarriage is an I word um, in lots of different ways and trying to help people understand that not only do the majority of American Jews marry people of other faith backgrounds, but in order to be, in order to treat everyone, B'Tzal Elohim created in the divine image, that includes Jews and all of their loved ones. And so thinking about the ways in which we keep the doors open uh, and we open up more avenues for conversations so that eventually everyone is aware that, um, you know, we are making this progress um, and that it is simultaneously not just a Jewish issue or an American issue. Um, and this is where my, my research with Jewish, Muslim and Christian women um, comes to mind because it's, it's a global issue. And, and that's really where um, I, I, I think ultimately we'll, we'll go in the long run. And I'm excited about that. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. And now I want to open for some questions to our audience. If you would like to ask a question, please write it in the question section below the video. And I will do my best to get through as many of these questions as possible and to ask our panelists to respond to them. And also, please feel free to use the chat feature to add your comments and your thoughts. And I would like to end by saying this was a remarkable experience for me. I really want to thank Shira, Karen, and Sarah uh, for the opportunity I have had to get to know your work better, get to learn from you, and I'm sure that our audience feels the same way. Thank you so much to each one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you for all of the energy in the chat. 
and for all of the responses during the panel. And hello, Karen, and hello, Shira, for some questions here. Um, I want to tell our audience that unfortunately, Sarah is unable to join us for the Q&A, um, but we will proceed because we've got lots of wonderful questions. Um, the first one is from someone who has asked, I loved everything that was shared, but how do you start when you have a group of well-intentioned staff who have nothing in place? Shira, can we start with you on that one? Sure. Um, I'd say first know that you're not alone. There are a lot of well-intentioned people um, who have nothing in place. And so just get started. Um, don't, don't feel like you have to do everything all at once. Pick one place to start. And often the best place to start is, as we've been saying, by talking about it, having a conversation, doing a lunch and learn, um, just even a focus group, a workshop, just opening up a book study, just start talking. Uh, and then once you're in that a little bit, um, or maybe you are when you say well-intentioned, maybe people are like, we're ready to roll up our sleeves, we wanna get going. Um, and so what you could do is you could go onto our Kayleen website and just look at the modules. And so use those, if you will, as a table of contents. Each module is broken up into subsections. Pick one subsection and say, this, this feels like something our organization needs to do. We need to develop some protocols, um, some procedures around this, and we need to talk about it. We need to make some choices. And so the material is really all there for you, but the work is not downloading it and saying, we now have a policy. The work is in discussing it and working through those choices. And if you're really stuck and don't know where to start, I'd say start with values because it all comes back to the values and you build on the values and based on the choices you make for your values, and maybe you already have them, so it's re-looking really at them, um, based on those choices, then that will impact what your policy ultimately looks like. Thank you, Shira. Karen, your reaction to this question? Well, I, of course, second everything that Shira, that Shira just shared with us and emphasize values, values, values. I would also add that I think it's really important for people to leave room for the possibility of making mistakes and know that that's okay and that's part of the process. You know, not only are we not alone, but we're also human and therefore inherently fallible and, and that we'll learn from our mistakes. We'll, um, take one step forward and then maybe a, a little step backwards, but, but ultimately two more steps forward and, and to just to, to dive in and, and to get going on, on the work itself, not to be afraid of, of making mistakes. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. You know, there was a lot of conversation during the panel about normalizing. And there's a question here about, so how do we normalize conversations? I, <laughs> thank you, Robert. I've been thinking a lot about this. And, you know, I think the first thing we must do is to invert this idea that calling out bad behavior is somehow Lashon Hara or idle gossip. It is not. Um, calling out bad behavior is, in fact, uh, a mitzvah. It is what we are responsible and need to do. So we need to uh, accurately interpret our sacred texts while, rather than misinterpret them. And then um, I think we need to actually create incentives for both individuals to um, get involved in this work, to come forward or speak out if, if that's possible for them, and for institutions and organizations. Because currently, I think that people just see the disincentives. You know, there's the concern about um, being accused of, of Lashon Hara. There's the concern about um, one's personal and professional um, status or success uh, or how one's career might be affected. Uh, and then the institutions and the organizations are, of course, concerned about what they might be um, uh, <laughs> potentially liable for or or opening themselves up to. And ultimately, I believe we need to um, ask ourselves, what are some incentives that we can create for people? Um, and how can we 
um, publicize those incentives and, and get more people involved. So as this links to the first question in terms of you know individuals to be thinking about what do we want our community to look like? What do we want our our Jewish spaces and, and organizations and institutions to look like and to know that we are we are those. We are our community. Um, mm -hmm. every, every community, every institution, every organization is made up of individuals. So incentives, yeah. need them. Thanks, Karen. Um, there's a bunch of questions about um, some really, really strong questions. So thank you, everyone, for sending them in. Um, I'm going to pretty much do them in the order that they came in um, because they're also great. Um, so there's a question about um, perpetrators, for want of a better word. Um, how can we make space for the perpetrators, for lack of a better word, says the, the person is putting in the question, to own their behavior in a way where they aren't totally shut out, except unless in extreme cases? I know that's a heavy question. Um, Karen, would you like to start with that one? <laughs> Not really, but I will. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I'm going to respect that and turn and ask Shira, would you like to? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I think we need to get better at holding nuance. Um, and I think on this topic, we tend to think of ourselves as very sophisticated. And yet we jump very quickly towards reintegration of people who have caused harm. Um, but we forget some beginning steps. We forget the steps um, that are outlined uh, both by the Rambam and um, Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg in her new book uh, on repentance and repair, which is very clearly um, outward signs, things that we should expect to see in place. And so like, here's one example is like, we have so many instances of individuals who have been harmed saying, this person who caused me harm never came to me, never apologized, never like tried to make things right in whatever way that would have looked like, but they're standing up publicly and apologizing to the masses, but I'm the person that has been harmed, right? And so obviously that's very complicated and um, somebody might not want to be contacted. So there are ways to, to navigate that. But my, my point is simply that I think we can do both but then we have to really be doing both and we can't just do one. And certain rules have to be in place, right? So um, I don't know, take a synagogue setting, for example. Somebody wants to come and pray at synagogue, right? And a person who abused them um, also wants to pray at the same synagogue. And they say, hey, I've done shiva, I've repented. Don't we believe in repentance? Hey, Rabbi, didn't you just talk about this on Yom Kippur? Why can't I come back to the synagogue? And the answer would be, go to another synagogue. If you understand that the the person you victimized is in this synagogue and you want them to be able to come and pray and feel safe and you've got 10 other synagogues in town, the fact that you have to choose this one, it actually indicates that you don't get it. And so I think we need to find ways that people are not written off completely for every mistake that they made or even more than mistakes. We have to leave room for people um, to, to move forward in healthy, adaptive ways, because it's better for everyone if, if we do and we create a safer society. Um, but we must center uh, the voices of victims, survivors, persisters, uh, the people who have been harmed in that conversation. And we must remember that we have to balance both sides. And I would add here, you know, we see people consulting attorneys and communication firms on figuring out how to navigate a very difficult, tense situation. You know, are they consulting with victim advocates? Are they calling up um, survivors in a, in a paid capacity, people who have come out and this is their life's work and saying, in responding to this, how can we do better? And how can we move forward in a way that feels um, as safe as possible and where we're showing as much support as possible? Karen, do you want to end? I mean, I... I... Yes, no worries. Thank you, Shira, for that beautiful answer. and. I would, I would say that, you know, I appreciate the question because I do think that it's important to hold space both for anyone and for the reality that we are all part of the larger Jewish community. And that includes the, the folks who, um, who hurt other people. And 
that we need to hold that space for them as well. And at the same time, not rush to the chuva process, um, which was my initial discomfort. Um, and I think that part of the rush to that is what I referred to earlier in terms of some of the the discomfort with the, the with the topic itself and the the conversations that we need to be having. You know, the rush to kind of make things better or make things right. You know, and it, it depends. I mean, there's there is the the nuance and also just the gradation, right? Um, not all acts are are the same. Um, and not all of them, you know, some have been uh, committed once uh, or many times or over many years and decades. So the pictures look different and, and that's where we need to take all of that into account and create space for those um, who, who, who did wrong um, to make right and to, to really look at our tradition and follow those ways um, not just in, in public, uh, also in ways that um, approach reparations, you know, that, that try to do some good uh, and they could actually participate or contribute to some of the work we're doing. Uh, that said, I want to be clear and careful that it's not about buying your way into good graces. Thanks for that. Uh... You know, there's a related question, and Shira, maybe I can ask you. This this one is about, and thank you, Ariel. What does survivor for sister support look like on a communal level? Um, what do we What do we think we? And you started speaking to this, Karen. Um, Shira, I wonder whether how you think about this. Um, what do we think um, someone needs? from us as a community after they have come forward? I'll start by saying that if you're not sure, just be quiet for a minute, right? Like people are so quick to jump to defend. And if you find yourself like with all these angsty feelings, just like you don't have to rush to social media and defend your institution. That would be just like a basic minimum. So I'm just putting that out there. In terms of proactive things to do, um, Dr. Gila Benchamal just published an article um, outlining six things that we should do as a community to support uh, victim survivors in our community. And so I'd say the very first thing you could do is read that article and have a conversation about it. Uh, maybe that sounds like a non-answer, but actually like that's the answer. This is where the Torah on this is and read it. It's one of the best articles I've seen written on this. Um, so I'm, I'm noting our time, and, and that's that's the tidbit I'll give you for that. Well, I think that's actually a sort of, a, we, we really don't have much more time, and I'm not going to ask another question. I just want to thank everyone for their questions. They're so thoughtful. Again, I want to thank um, Shira and Karen uh, for your um, expertise in this field, for your ownership and leadership. Um, for your thoughtfulness, for your generosity to others, um, and for building the field. And um, I just feel so privileged to be um, a part of the SRE network, because truly this is a field that is on a journey. And um, every time we have these convenings, I feel as if we are moving towards more innovation, more conversation, um, and um, a better response. So thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, Thank you for having me.